Hello. Hello. Welcome to uh, Criminological Theory. My name is Tara and I am your professor and I've posted uh, recorded lectures um, previously last week. So this is week two and we are going to discuss Michel Foucault and I'm going to discuss the article, the core reading uh, that is on the syllabus, which makes reference to Foucault and the idea of security. I hope you are all doing well, and I hope you enjoy the lecture. Also, if you're interested, I teach another class called Race, Ethnicity, and Crime in the Criminology Department as well. And it is a purely asynchronous class. So there are no uh, in-class meetings. And we will be meeting um, once a week uh, in person um, in criminological theory. And I've sent you... a. Uh, the details about our meetings, which are also posted online. So I will discuss the prison industry and criminology, and I will talk about the prison industry from a Foucauldian perspective, drawing on the reading. But I will also talk about the prison industrial complex uh, as a capitalist industry and as an industry that consistently uh, profits from incarceration. So firstly, I'll play a clip of Dr. Ellie Anderson discussing Foucault and genealogy. And Dr. Anderson has a channel called Overthink Podcast with, with a lot of really interesting and useful uh, discussions about philosophy. Canadian Tire's birthday big red event. The price is as low as we go this season. Save up to 60% on kitchen up history. But studying history, Foucault picks up on some of the themes that we've encountered in the course so far with respect to the fact that humans are in a state of collective historical becoming. There's no essential human nature, but there is rather historical contingency, relations of power rampant inequities. He's distrustful not only of the idea of a human nature that would be ahistorical, which virtually everyone in the course that we've read has been distrustful of, but he's also distrustful of the idea of progress, along with some of the other thinkers that we've been reading recently. I want to say something about Foucault's method and how it relates to this idea in Nietzsche genealogy history, Foucault talks about his method as being one of genealogy. And the fun thing about this text is that, of course, it picks up directly not only from Nietzsche, but from Nietzsche's account of history, which we've read. So for Foucault, genealogy is the method of uncovering the roots of present day thinking. In order to uncover the roots of present day thinking, we need to study history. But studying history isn't enough. We need to study history with a particular eye for the details and accidents that accompany the beginnings of a certain concept or a certain way of being. So we need to study source materials. We need the body. And we need to study the lowly condition of everyday folks rather than just the sort of ruling powers of a given time period. Genealogy is not about a search for origins in the sense of where is the origin of the concept of capitalism, but rather in thinking about the sort of messy origins of things, the way that things develop before realizing they're developing. Genealogy is not about crafting a single perfect master narrative, but about picking up in a meticulous and patient manner, as Foucault describes it, on what appear to be unexpected connections. 
he says on page 78 that the secret behind things is that they have no essence. And similarly, things have no single origin, concepts, values, institutions, societies, configurations, all emerge in a complex and sort of hodgepodge way. Foucault is interested in showing the heterogeneous nature of existing institutions, the heterogeneity of what was imagined consistent with itself, the absence of essence in what is imagined to have an essence. Like Nietzsche, Foucault questions the kind of history that assumes a perspective outside of history. History, he describes on page 87, and here he's talking about effective history, which he draws from Nietzsche, places within a process of development everything that is considered immortal. This kind of history has no constants and is filled with discontinuities because that is the nature of the way things are. And everything has a history in Foucault's sense, even feelings, even bodies. What we imagine has no history is still historically rooted. Genealogy is interested in finding the hidden histories of what appears to be without history. With that in mind, I want to think a little bit about sex, power, and the politics of identity, which is an interview that Foucault gave. So Foucault was one of the few out gay philosophers of his day. But in this interview, we see that he is quite critical of the gay liberation movement that was happening at the time of his writing. And one of the reasons for this is that Foucault takes issue with the way that the gay liberation movement assumed that individuals have a given fixed identity that needs to be celebrated. For Foucault, the beauty and promise of both genealogy and also of questioning the given categories of sexuality that we've been given, and especially the presumption of heterosexuality that had been dominant for so much of history, is precisely in not taking for granted that identities are fixed, but rather in focusing on discontinuity, on change, on unforeseen transformations. So as Foucault describes it on page 164, the gay movement has normalized homosexuality by moving away from the way that it had previously been medicalized. So individuals were considered perverse, were persecuted, were put under psychiatric holds for homosexual activities and desires. And Foucault says, yes, well, the gay movement responded to that by saying homosexual desire is normal, right? The problem is that in doing this, in very importantly resisting the medicalization of homosexual desires and activities, the gay liberation movement had recourse to the idea of a fixed identity or inner truth in saying, this is who I am, it is normal, accept me. And for Foucault, that runs against all of his philosophical influences, right? Think back to Nietzsche's idea that there is no inner self to be found. Your true self is above you, not within you. We are onions without a single core. And so for Foucault, what we need to do is to see identity as a game, when we allow ourselves to say, this is who I am, I've always been this way, this is a fixed essence, we're not only kind of running afoul of some of the continental philosophy that Foucault is influenced by, but we are also leaving ourselves open to surveillance, to censure, to a kind of legal and positivist model of essence. And that is actually quite dangerous, he thinks. It's also pretty capitalist in essence, right? When we're so focused on identity, we're interested in activities and things on the basis of whether they conform to my given identity, right? Is this who I am? And we become so obsessed and so fixated on who we are that we fail to recognize transformative new possibilities. Sexual identity, he says on page 166, has been useful, but it is also limiting. Wix gives you the power of AI to build the website you need with full
so that is a clip and I'll play uh more clips from the Overthink mm -hmm. podcast um throughout the class and I'll also play clips from another uh channel called Theory and Philosophy um and hopefully uh the course will give you um a broad range of perspectives regarding philosophy and different approaches to crime and punishment and to the state. So this week's reading uh, was written by Mariana Belverde, uh, who is a Canadian criminologist and sociologist and a professor in the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, her research mainly focuses on the sociology of law. So I will discuss a few points and I will record the lecture in two parts. So this will be part one. Firstly, I will discuss security and discipline. Then I will discuss uh, the concept of a regime of truth from Foucault, Thirdly, I will discuss discipline and knowledge. Fourthly, I will talk about the panopticon. And fifthly, I will discuss biopolitics and biopower. And finally, I'll finish by discussing homo sacer, which is a concept from Giorgio Gambin that I will mention uh, throughout the class. And it's a recurring concept from many of the readings. So firstly, security and discipline. The article is really interesting and it offers a great reading of Foucault and a really interesting discussion about security and what security actually allows for and does. So the author cites Foucault and Foucault's lectures in which uh, Michel Foucault discusses the ways that security is not discipline. And what security actually does uh, instead of discipline is to allow for certain freedoms. So if I was to discipline you and tell you not to speak, you would not speak, you would be told no. But what security actually does is to allow you to speak and then put you under surveillance uh, in order to judge what you say. So security is actually more effective from the perspective of criminal justice, because rather than telling people no, security corresponds with capitalism, which tells people yes, but also then puts them under surveillance. So first, where discipline combined, concentrated, and enclosed its space of operation, security Securité was central, centrifugal. The apparatuses of security have the constant tendency to expand. They're centrifugal. Security therefore involves organizing or anyway allowing the development of circuits. Second, whereas discipline focused on even the smallest infractions, security let the small things let the small things go. So what's interesting about security is that um, you let certain things go. So if I go back to the example of speech, you allow people to speak freely, you let certain things go. But when you are monitoring people for their speech acts, um, you can also collect evidence. The internet is a great example. So um, rather than being told, no, you cannot use the internet, you are told you are free, you can speak. However, uh, if you write certain things on the internet, they can be used as evidence uh, against you. So um, your internet activity can be monitored. Um, things that you have written on the internet could be uh, used uh, to judge your political opinions or participation in say political movements um, that could be involved or that could uh, challenge the state. So Wet'suwet'en um, 
the, or the protests in Wet'suwet'en and concerning um, indigenous rights are a good example that many people who engage in protests and sol solidarity with indigenous peoples might use the internet um, to organize. However, this kind of use of speech on the internet and use of language uh, can be used uh, to find people who have been engaged in protests, find activists, and uh, to put people under surveillance. So third, whereas discipline sought to eliminate and eradicate completely, security in contrast tried only to minimize, to seek an optimal level of the targeted behavior to achieve a certain equilibrium not to eliminate, but to regulate to the most advantageous level. So security or security corresponds with capitalism. The capitalism needs people to have a certain amount of freedom or to feel free. Um, in order to also regulate those who uh, might not uh, have a great deal of capital or housing security and could therefore um, be policed, unfortunately. Uh, I would argue that in many instances where people are policed, they are lower income people or poor people. Um, and what is actually under threat is capitalism. So, I mentioned the Wet'suwet'en protest, in case uh, you're not familiar, from January to March 2020, a series of civil disobedience De civil disobedience protests were held in Canada over the construction of the coastal gas link pipeline uh, through 190 kilometers of Wet'suwet'en First Nation territory in British Columbia, land that is unceded. So this kind of protest movement is on the internet and there's a lot written about it, but security or security works to the extent that we have freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom to protest, but this level of freedom, this kind of letting people speak, uh, also corresponds with security and surveillance. In some, security differed significantly from discipline and its modes of functioning. As Foucault explained, an apparatus of security cannot operate well except on con cannot operate well except on condition that it is given freedom in the modern sense that it acquires in the 18th century no longer the exemptions and privileges attached to a person but the possibility of movement change of place and processes of circulation of both people and things so freedom for Foucault um, involves unfreedom. I mean, when you allow, if the state uh, is the arbiter of freedom, then when the state grants you freedom, uh, the state can also put you under surveillance um, and monitor your behavior and then subsequently limit that freedom. So this possibility of movement, uh, change of place and processes of circulation of both people and things allow for freedom, but the people and things are really people and things who are circulating within capitalism. Um, and when we move within capitalism, when our things move, when our credit cards move, uh, we are entering into a system of uh, security and surveillance. 
Security and surveillance will obviously protect people and protect our interests and our capital and protect our uh, private property. However, um, if one is seen to be a threat to the private property of others, then surveillance can escalate to policing and then to incarceration or to murder. So the second point is this idea of a regime of truth. And Michel Foucault's writing is really expansive. Um, Foucault's writing has been used to discuss uh, many uh, events and sociological phenomenon. The history of sexuality is one of the most well-cited texts in queer theory and gender studies. Um, Foucault's writing has also been used to discuss um, media in detail and the production of media discourse. Uh, Foucault's writing has also been used to discuss HIV and AIDS as well. Um, and Anne Laura Stoller is a post-colonial scholar and Stoller draws on Foucault to discuss the relationship between sexuality, race, and colonialism. Um, so there are many uses of Foucault uh, in the liberal arts and humanities and social sciences. We've already discussed genealogy. So in this section of the essay, the author discusses um, the relationship between subjects and objects and processes of subjectivation, subjectivization, sorry, subjectivization and objectivization that allow for the subject to become as subject, an object of knowledge. So how does the subject become an object of knowledge? Understanding these inter interdependent processes is ultimately a question of veredictions and truth games that can establish the rules according to which, with respect to certain things, what a subject may say stems from questions of truth and fault, falsehood. Uh, and... Mariana Valverde uh, cites Foucault here. The history of veredictions understood as the forms according to which according to which discourses capable of being deemed true or false are articulated with a domain of things. What the conditions of that emergence have been, what price has been paid for it, as it were, what effects it has had on the real and the way in which linking a certain type of object with certain modalities of the subject, it is constituted for a time, a space, and particular individuals, the historical a priori of a possible experience. So in another essay, Foucault discusses regimes of truth. And in this essay, Foucault argues that rather than thinking of things as being true or false, um, there is a regime of truth, a way of speaking about things that makes certain things true. And uh, Stuart Hall, who, is, who unfortunately passed away, uh, was a Black British cultural studies scholar, a Marxist and post-colonial scholar. And the example that Hall gave when discussing regimes of truth uh, was the British media. And Hall argued in certain instances, the British media referred to Palestinians as freedom fighters. And Foucault I mean, sorry, Hall also then discussed instances where Palestinians were written of in, in negative ways within the global war on terror. So the ways that we speak about things for Foucault and for those writing after Foucault 
matters perhaps more than the actual truth of events, that how we interpret events using language obviously matters more. And uh, I've discussed Judith Butler's writings in previous lectures. Judith Butler uh, is also interested in the production of truth using language. So how are discourses capable of being deemed true or false? What are the material conditions in which certain certain discourses are produced uh, that we understand to be true. Um, do we think of uh, alcoholism uh, as a symptom of class antagonism that is an assault against the working class or poor, or do we think of alcoholism as a moral failing or uh, a health issue uh, that involves genetics? Um, all of these ways of making sense of social phenomenon uh, involve productions of a regime of truth that is, I believe, produced in a certain political context and a socioeconomic context, and always with reference to history. So again, I'll cite the author, truth games that can establish the rules according to which, with respect to certain things, what a subject may say stems from questions of truth or falsehood. So truth games then are about rules, um, the rules in which we speak about things, the kind of um, the kind of discourse that allows us to speak certain truths um, and omit certain details. In other words, writes the author, the question of how a subject becomes an object of knowledge is not a question about the truth or falsity of a particular subject or subject as object, but rather about how there comes to be a way of talking about truth or falsehood at all. And so again, I return to my example. Um, how we speak about the truth or falsehood of alcoholism is really about um, a particular subject who becomes an object of scholarly inquiry. Uh, the subject could be an object of Marxist scholarly inquiry, and if so, Marxists often produce knowledge about the working class and the poor, and commodity fetishism, meaning the use of commodities as a way of signifying human feeling and relationships. So alcohol becomes a way of signifying friendship or even romantic love or enjoyment. Um, and so Marxists would produce the subject uh, or produce a subject who is an object of a certain scholarly inquiry. This is also true of healthcare providers who might look at alcoholism uh, from the perspective of health. Um, and religious scholars might think about morality. The project which he, meaning Foucault, insisted connected the breadth of his work was to illuminate these rules, these truth games, and these practices of establishing truth. So how do we establish a truth? How does a subject become an object of knowledge in which we um, construct a truth about his or her, their life? Uh, how do we construct a truth about a certain phenomenon like the consumption of alcohol. It was centered 
on discourses and the savoirs under which practices and techniques can be meaningful, meaningfully referred to in a language of truth or falsehood. Foucault's research on the history of prisons did not come out of criminological interests after all, but rather from the sense that prisons were important laboratories for many of the new techniques of governance used in modern industrial societies after the mid 19th century. So the ways that we speak about prisons uh, how prisons become an object of scholarly inquiry and how people in prisons become an object of scholarly inquiry is really the result of a whole series of truth gains. So, for Foucault, these truth gains are a set of procedures that lead to certain results, which on the basis of principles and rules of procedures may be considered valid or invalid. So for Foucault, truth games are not actually games that are objectively played where we understand the truth of something. Um, they are games that have a certain set of rules that will lead to the production of a certain truth. So like a lot of games, the rules themselves will determine the results. So if we were to uh, think about the academic industrial complex, if the kind of game we play is about an essay uh, written in academic English, then obviously if someone does not speak English, uh, then the truth will be produced that they are not a good student. Um, and so these kind of procedures already uh, produce this truth. So the procedures of the games will all, always lead to certain, certain results. Um, and it, it's perhaps only if one was to move away from these procedures, say the collection of academic knowledge about a subject that one could gain something else besides the expected truth. So the third point then is discipline and knowledge. Foucault's account of discipline, therefore, resonated with the methodological and political preferences that already existed among critical criminolo criminologists, beginning to find Marxism either tired or insufficient, but wishing to maintain a left-wing stance. Discipline was clearly linked by Foucault to the rise of the industrial proletariat, and bourgeoisie society's need for working bodies with standardized capacities. But the discipline and punished story carefully avoided making capital the, mo the motor force of history. So for Foucault, uh, the production of knowledge and the production of state power is just as important as the making of modern capital. So in, an additional factor that explains why Foucault's work itself became the victim of the success of successive discipline concerns Foucault's analysis of the relation between knowledges and powers, which in Discipline and Punish which is one of Foucault's most well cited books, was not as clearly distinguished from the critique of ideology approach as would be the case in latter work on governmentality and security and on sexuality and ethics. That supposedly neutral knowledges, such as psychology or social work, wield a great deal of power, even when used benevolently, was already an accepted point of view in the 1970s and the left at any rate. 
and it must be recalled that the left was then relatively much larger than it is today. Foucault's analysis of the role of expert knowledges in the formation and implementation of disciplinary apparatuses was thus not completely novel. And I've pulled certain passages from the readings for the purposes of the class because there will be assignments or tests uh, that will focus on certain aspects of the reading. Many readers of Discipline and Punish miss the fact that Foucault took the critical view of knowledge and power one crucial step further. Instead of, instead of focusing on the ways in which knowledge systems could function as delivery systems of ideology, Foucault argued more radically and that knowledges themselves are, form, are forms of power. Um, sorry, that knowledges are themselves forms of power. So from the Marxist perspective, ideology is the idea of kind of unseen knowledge that we uh, use to do commonsensical things that are in fact uh, only commonsensical if we accept capitalism as an overarching narrative in all of our lives, uh, in every instance and forever. So for Marx, um, the kind of Marxist maxim of ideology is they do not know what they are doing and yet they are doing it. And so for Marx, we kind of all buy things or we ascribe value to certain things because of capitalism. But for Foucault, knowledge is not simply um, imparting of ideology. Knowledge is itself power. So Foucault moves away from this idea that knowledge is a mimetic reflection of capitalist ideology. And Foucault argues that knowledge is actually producing power through discourse and through certain ways of producing the truth, um, using language and using certain modes of discipline that allow us to speak about certain things in certain ways. So knowledge is not simply a reflection of capitalist ideology. Knowledge is productive of state power and productive of uh, certain historical truths and also certain norms. So Foucault uh, wrote extensively about sex and sexuality. So rather than being uh, a reflection of say capitalist ideas of power, uh, knowledge also produces certain ways of thinking about the body and sex. So the fourth point is the panopticon and the panopticon is a concept uh, that draws on the writings of Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham to look at security and surveillance. So this is a clip about panopticons. If you struggle with... So I guess a good example before uh, we look at the clip, um, just for clarity, and it's just my interpretation of Foucault, but if we were to compare Marx's concept of ideology to Foucault's concept of power, then in Marx and Engels wrote about the family. And for Marx and Engels, the family is really um, a capitalist entity where people inherit familial wealth in order to invest in more forms of private property and those who are not out, or people who are outside of the family who cannot inherit private property um, are often those who are alienated from capitalism so uh, the bourgeois middle class family can have children their children can inherit their wealth and then the bourgeoisie can marry each other and and produce stronger and stronger families in economic terms. For Foucault, the family itself is a fiction and it is a fiction that becomes truthful only when we speak about the family in certain ways. So when we speak about the family as a cisgender heterosexual unit, 
we lend truth to the myth that this is a family or the only family. And in reality, now in contemporary Canada and throughout the world, people discuss the family, say, in terms of the queer community or chosen families. So Foucault is not just interested in the ways that the family is a capitalist unit or uh, the family is a production of capitalist ideology. The family is also a certain truth that is produced through regimes of truth that change across time and space, meaning the ways that we uh, value the family or what we believe to be a family itself changes depending on how we speak about this term family. So I'll play this clip now about the panopticon, which is another interesting idea from Michelle. Okay, right, so today we're talking about the panopticon, which is a word chances are we all know. Uh, and this is a, a channel called Theory and Philosophy. Um, and I will make reference to it. And it is uh, a series of, again, uh, YouTube videos um, that discuss theory and philosophy um, and offer an interpretation of key concepts uh, that are really useful in the liberal arts and humanities and It is David Guignon's uh, channel. Hope I've pronounced this person's name correctly. Um, and David is currently a visiting assistant professor in Occidental College's Critical Theory and Social Justice Department. And David holds a PhD from Western University's Media Studies Department. And I should also note Dr. Elliot Anderson also has a channel that we watched called the Overthink Podcast. And Dr. Al, uh, Dr. Anderson is a philosopher and a writer and professor who is based in Los Angeles. Oh, you know, panopticon, post-structuralism, who cares, whatever. I don't want this to be like super basic, so I want to try and explain it in a great amount of detail so that, you know, you get something new from this, I hope. Uh, so there's a lot to cover. We're getting into it. Um, you can find this in podcast form anywhere where you get podcasts. Leave a comment on there because uh, I, I think I know how to check it. But it, at the very least, leave a bunch of stars because that, that'd be great. Um, if you're listening to this in podcast form, you can find me on YouTube where I do videos. If you want to see my, uh, my mugshot, then if you want, don't feel obliged. Um, you can support me by simply subscribing, liking, sharing. Telling your family, who knows, your great aunt might get a real kick out of this. And again, she might not. You can also uh, contribute monetarily with uh, Patreon or uh, PayPal. Links for all that will be in the description, which would be a great help. But take care of yourself first or, you know, contribute to an organization that could really use that support uh, much more than me. So the Panopticon. Let me give you the rundown of what Foucault does in his book titled Discipline and Punish. So he lays out that for a very long time, we were under what was he, what he calls sovereign rule, where there was sovereign power. And that was the situation in which there was like a king or monarch or something that demonstrated their military and their disciplinary might by inflicting harm on people. So if you stepped in a line, it was the responsibility of the sovereign to punish you, not directly, they had people to do it for them, but to punish you so that you could not only suffer, because the, your body at that time was seen as a site of suffering, 
You could be made an example of so that other people won't commit the crime that you commit because they know how shitty the outcome is. So he calls this the spectacle of the scaffold in which people in like the town square were tortured brutally for everyone to see. Now this raised a few problems for power. And Foucault says that, well, if you demonstrate your power in such an overt way, that is for everyone to see, you leave yourself open to some kind of attack, or at the very least, you become the very point in which all power emanates from. And it becomes very easy then for power to be usurped, which didn't necessarily happen all the time. So some of the other ways that people were uh, directly affected would be, they would be thrown into dungeons, and if they weren't tortured, they were essentially hidden away from sight so that they wouldn't be a part of society. And above, maybe not above that, but additionally, you know, people would be cast out uh, of society, especially if they were mad um, or anything like that, so that they wouldn't be a burden on society. But at some point, something changed. And we see a transition from what Foucault described as sovereign power to disciplinary power. And disciplinary power operates differently. It doesn't seek to just inflict harm on the body, or it doesn't seek to just make an example out of people by showing how much they can suffer so that other people will be deterred from committing a crime. It also claims to change people. It also claims to make people proper for society. So instead of it being a matter of inflicting harm on someone who was only to be ultimately judged by God, suddenly society saw itself as being the arbiter of what was good and right, and it could inflict harm against people in order to make them better for society. So it wouldn't always be physical uh, torture. You know, it would be rehabilitation. It would be counseling. It would be anything like that. I think it's important to say that if your takeaway from this is to despise all sites of power, be it like psychiatry or, um, you know, counseling, anything like that, then it, while you might be right, according to Foucault, we shouldn't do away with all of these potentially beneficial institutions, especially for people who, who really need it. So to keep that on the back burner. So this marked a shift, right, as I've already kind of said. But previously, if someone committed a crime, the sovereign, that is the king, queen, monarch, whatever, felt as though they were the one that was attacked, right? They were the one that took the burden of the crime. With disciplinary power, suddenly other people get involved, and an attack against society is then felt as an attack on the social body. So it's an attack on everyone. And so with this, we see a kind of percolation of a resentment of criminals. Whereas previously, and Foucault documents this, there was almost a fascination with criminals, almost like in the moments where someone was being tortured, they were closer to God because they were closer to death, and that therefore they possessed some kind of innate or superior knowledge of the world. Not to mention the fact that they had the courage to challenge the king or monarch, queen or anything. This inflictment of new pain against the uh, social body demanded a new form of I guess organization as far as power went. And here we enter the Panopticon. So the Panopticon was a structure proposed by Jeremy Bentham, a utilitarian philosopher who wanted to make prison structures more instrumental, to make them more economic, more effective. So I'm sure we all know, but pan optic means sight, optic, pan all around, so all around sight. And this is what the structure looks like. It is a circular structure with a guard tower in the middle. And the guard tower is a 360 degree view of the circular ring structure. And the circular ring structure is comprised of prison cells that can all be viewed from the watchtower. Now, it is unclear from the vantage point of the prisoner if there is a guard in the guard tower. So, 
what happens, and Foucault is very quick to pick up on this, it doesn't actually matter if there's a guard in there because the people don't know if they're being watched. So he says something, something interesting happens here, and that is that the people start to watch themselves. And that happens out of the fear of them being watched. So one example that I take from a, a prof that I had many years ago, uh, Dr. Brophy, and I think it's an apt example, he said, well, if you're driving, you know, let's say you're in the prairies, if you're in Canada or in the desert in, uh, you know, Nevada somewhere, you're driving and you come across a stop sign and you can see for miles and miles and miles and you know for a fact that there is not a cop in sight. Many of us still stop. I'm not saying everyone does. And it would be wrong to think that Foucault is saying everyone suddenly follows the rules and everyone is suddenly uh, a cog in this machine. But some of us stop. And that is a very interesting phenomenon. And it demonstrates this panoptic structure at play where we, instead of uh, us being watched, we are governing ourselves. So Foucault, looking at this then, says it, it opens up a whole bunch of interesting implications. It means for him, and this is, these are his words, that visibility is a trap. So while we might think that it might be better to be out in the open, it might be better for us to be seen, because that's how we express ourselves, that's how I communicate with everyone on YouTube or in podcast form or whatever, well, it might appear like this is a demonstration of one's own identity, one's own freedom. Foucault warns that these types of visibility or these opening it, openings up or forays into visibility might actually be sites of control. Now, how does that make sense? Well, I like to imagine it like a kid in a sandbox. So the sandbox to the kid might appear to have infinite potential, right? You know. Sky's the limit. Your imagination is the only thing slowing you down. But to an outside observer, we know that the sandbox is kind of demarcated. It's, it's bordered by these like four walls that structure it in a very clear way. But within the structure, there's a great deal of opportunity allowed. The kid, however, doesn't think about the walls. The kid's only focused on the sand and all the possibilities afforded by it. And it's in those that moment or in this kind of... Um, our feelings of, of kind of pure freedom, this kind of pure potential, that we might actually be the most controlled. So Foucault says that the panoptic structure allows people to be seen instantly, and then being seen then opens them up to specific kinds of surveillance so that they can be, they can be controlled, they can be organized, they can be clumped into masses. And this sets the timber for biopolitics, a, a term I'll do another, another day where people are organized according to populations, uh, and it really benefits from this panoptic structure, this panoptic form of power, which is what he says is the ideal form of power, because there isn't a point that we could say that it is from there that power is emanating. It is from there I'm being controlled. No, it is us that has come to internalize the eye of power, and we then control ourselves. So another thing that Foucault makes very apparent and you, not really apparent, he just says it flat out, power is productive. It makes people act. So like the kid in the sandbox, as soon as he enters the sandbox, he enters into a very clearly marked off controlled zone. But that zone, the sandbox, makes the kid operate in a certain way. That is, the kid wants to play with the sand and make certain structures and dig holes and eat sand. I don't know whatever kids do in the sand. The kid wants to do these things, and this is a product of this kind of established zones, kind of established system that is limited only by the kid themselves in their minds, but is actually very well managed and, and coded. So there are no more bars. There are no more like prison guards per se, none of that. There is just the pure functioning of power that has been completely internalized. Now, it's... I, I've covered this whole book in a lot more detail in on my channel and, and podcast form. So go check that out if you want a more full, a fuller account. But it seems a little bit reductive to say that we've just like kind of fallen into this new disciplinary power system and that's all there is to it. He does complicate it a bit, but it, it is a little bit 
uh, reductive, and I'd like to hear what other people have to say, um, but just throwing that out there. The Panopticon, then, because of its kind of visible character, is then going to be open to kind of democratic uh, alternatives and, and changes and movements. And the reason for that is that, you know, there's no single point of power, as I've made clear. Instead, Foucault says that the Panopticon operates democratically, and that's what makes it so pernicious. It makes it appear as though, um, you know, encouraging you to participate in some while foreclosing others to you. And this is used in all walks of life. Take the, uh, the hospital, for instance, where humans are reduced to, you know, observable uh, symptomatic entities that can then be put under a certain uh, kind of microscopic um, lens so that they could be better understood, so they could be mapped and coded and controlled, or schools or offices that are designed in such a way as to make people always visible. Because if you're always visible, then you not only fear the you know thought of other people seeing you, you start to wonder, how do I appear to myself? Do I like who I am? Which is a moment in, you know, I guess, disciplinary power that is only possible when we have moved away from locating power at a certain site, that is the king or whatever, to ourselves. So we see that the panopticon is an individuating machine. It makes of people individuals that, you know, are isolated in their bodies. And this is, you know, uh, certainly in keeping with the atomistic principle of capitalism and its emergence. But we could become so absorbed with ourselves that, you know, it, it hinders the possibility of collective engagement in certain ways, which is, you know, one of the implications that Foucault doesn't really address, but it, but it's certainly there. So with the functioning of the Panopticon and its extension into all walks of life, we see the entrance of a new form of kind of control, one that moves beyond disciplinary control into pure carceral control, which is the term he attributes to this moment in which all people govern themselves perfectly according to a perfect movement of power. And that's more or less it. I hope this is short and sweet. Um, you know, leave comments and likes and tell me if I did something wrong. Uh, you know, I would yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Um, or if you have any recommendations for what to do next, I'd happily take them. Uh, but on that note, take care. So that is a clip about the Panopticon, which Mariana Valverde discusses in the reading. Um, and so in the interest of time, I'll finish by discussing the Panopticon. And then in the second part of the lecture, I will talk about the remaining uh, concept. Um, so if discipline was the Foucauldian term with the greatest influence and success in criminology, silver metal undoubtedly belongs to the related term panopticon. Like Foucault's cr critique of disciplinary knowledges, then, Foucault's interest in Bentham's panopticon could be read in two different ways. The more radical and less common reading is interested in the panopticon as a novel technique, but does not demonize it, since from a Nietzschean perspective, there is no innocent knowledge. Thus, this reading would not hold out any hope that abolishing panopticons in prisons and surveillance would in itself create freedom. However, the panopticon allegory is more commonly interpreted from a quasi-Marxist perspective in which knowledges are seen as corrupt if and insofar they are imbricated in oppressive institutions. So for Foucault, uh, The production of knowledge is central to this idea of the panopticon and to surveillance. So if we know that we are being put under surveillance, if we know that we are under security, if we know that we are being watched by CCTV cameras or that uh, 
we have a certain social insurance number, um, a passport number, and we can be monitored at, to see if we are paying taxes or uh, one of the most obvious examples in our time period is citizenship, that we can be monitored uh, to, we can be monitored by the state um, and we can be monitored by institutions um, to determine whether we are quote unquote citizens or people who have uh, a capitalist claim to make in a country. Um, so in his 1975 work, work, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, Foucault writes, hence the major effect of the panopticon to induce in the inmate a state of conscious and per permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. So knowledge is central then to security. But security, which I began by discussing, is not just a matter of being put under surveillance. I mean, if we were to say that we are all under surveillance, like I I write something on the internet, I'm under surveillance. But I mean, how do I know I'm under surveillance? It's only at the point where I'm caught writing something um, or my posts are flagged, or I am sued for defamation, that I know that I have violated these rules. And that has never happened to me, no matter what I've written on the internet. But the very fact that I consider that I could be put under surveillance means that I am under surveillance. And the panopticon is this kind of um, prison-like structure where we are imprisoned i mean the example is obviously people who are in prison who are under surveillance and are aware that they are in prison but the panopticon can also be used to think as a metaphor i i believe for freedom that if we know that we are under surveillance if we know that we are being watched by the state then we must constantly prove ourselves and citizenship is a good example that if you wanted to say leave Canada um, for an extensive amount of time, would you be worried or would you feel as though uh, you were under surveillance? Another good example is credit cards and credit card debt or student debt, anything to do with banking. Um, if you have loans to pay, do you feel as though you are being monitored in some way? This feeling is more important than the obvious truth that you are one of so many people in a country or in a city. Um, but this feeling of being monitored is an effect of security. Um, Foucault pointed out that the panopticon is, from another perspective, the oldest dream of the most ancient sovereign, since it embodies the inherently sovereign desire to not ever lose sight of any subjects. So a good example, again, is anything to do with banking. I can go, I can take my credit cards to London, England, uh, and I can use them, but I'm always connected to the Canadian banking sector and even if i was to open a british bank account i would still have the, my canadian bank and this feeling of surveillance is also about monitoring oneself and one's spending which is then a really effective form of sovereign power that the state does not really need to constantly uh, intervene in your life to tell you no don't spend money no don't go anywhere um stay somewhere uh, where you can sell your labor or afford to live. Um, the state doesn't need to do this anymore because it has the system of security or surveillance uh, where you, you must monitor yourself. So I'll finish there in the interest of time. And in the second half of the lecture, I will discuss biopolitics and homo sacra. So thank you very much for uh, 
watching the first half of the lecture, um, and I hope that you are enjoying the class and the readings. Thank you. Bye-bye.